just want to make sure you guys know what you signed up for. This is what we're doing. We're bringing the kids to the prairie. And more often than not, we get it done. And it's a really cool thing. Schedule. You've got the schedule in front of you, the red sheet. So training is more than just today. Today, are we good? Today is orientation for you to have an idea of, of what it entails. And if this is not what you want, then here's your chance. The training gets you out there. We teach you the prairie. We teach you CONSA. We talk, we talk about the organization of the research station. We talk about the research that's happening here. We're going to go on a tour. I think that's tomorrow. Yeah, tour tomorrow. Got a, a mini bus from <laughs> Mary's daughter. <laughs> Wendy hooks us up. Got a mini bus. We take you out on the prairie and show you around and explain how the prairie is set up, or at least how this prairie is set up. Um, we do all of the activities and we talk about why we do these activities and we give you an idea on um, what to, how to condense the information and, and get the highlights to the kids because you know it's not about, you guys are very, very knowledgeable and we'll talk about all of your backgrounds. You're extremely knowledgeable. You know coming in, you know so much more than the kids do. It's not about how much you know, it's how much you can get them to see and experience. Um, if it's just, you know, this is this, this is that, this is this, this is that, they're gonna, they are gonna shut down. But if they're having fun and they're experiencing things and they can show you, th oh my goodness, if they can show you things, you have just won your battle. Yep, you have a new convert. And that's the coolest thing in the world. And, you know, Mary and, and Ken both can say, it's the coolest thing in the world when they come and show you stuff. It's neat. Um, okay, so the schedule. We meet each day. We have uh, eight training days here in spring and four training days in the autumn. And we meet each day, Tuesday through Friday, from 9 a.m. to noon-ish. Uh, you're not really going to get out later than noon. If you have an appointment or something that you need to go to, we're going to make sure that you can get to that. Uh, and we have full days each day. And so here's the schedule. We will have a couple of guest speakers. Um, if I sent you a previous schedule, there has been a change because one of our guest speakers needed to have a change. We have the fire boss from CONSA will be meeting with us, but he needed to move it, and so we moved his, his visit to March 7th, which is a Wednesday, and we switched that around with geology, which is um, this Thursday. So, just so you know. Then in the autumn, we have four more days of training because there's so many things that are autumn specific. You have grasses. We, have, we could talk about grasses today, but it would be kind of a, a futile subject. Um, but we need to talk about grasses in the autumn. We need to talk about grasshoppers in the autumn. And that's also when we go down to the stream. We could go to the stream right now, but it might be a little uncomfortable. And plus, it's kind of dry. And one of the funnest things we do is on the last day of training, we walk the third outermost loop of the nature trail with the experienced docents. So realize that I know that you guys know a lot of stuff. Um, and I welcome your input and welcome your, your thoughts and suggestions. Uh, you have a wealth of information in your, in your lifetimes. But I, what I'm going to show you is just what we as a, as a program do to introduce kids to the prairie. Um, let's take a look at the binders. These are yours. Uh, the table of contents, the colors are correlated with the color tabs. Mm -hmm. Mary's like, I didn't get those colors last year. <laughs> every, every year or something. Uh, okay, so our, our topics are, or our categories are background, cons of prairie, keep, the schoolyard, long-term ecological research activities, turn into the second page of the table of contents. We have in the kind of lavender, we have other educational activities, and we have an orange tab just for bison topics, then a uh, each for docent events and activities, and then on the third page, we have the yellow reference materials. And that's kind of the catch-all, the things that did neatly fit everything else. Um, so let's take a look 
have this binder so you can become familiar with it. You are welcome to write all over this. Like I said, this is yours. You can do whatever you want with it. Uh, background, there's a note for me. My, my official title is Director of Education. Okay. Um, taking a look at this note to you, docent is a word that, that you may or may not have heard before. That just means that you are a trained volunteer. You typically hear that term in a museum with docents that lead tour groups because they, they know a whole lot. You know, it's, it's beyond just being a volunteer. You know a lot and you're imparting your wisdom onto the group. And so you are a docent. This is the part of the docent group. We have, since 1996, we have trained over 300 docents. Right now we have about 80 active docents and you'll get to know them as they come and go and participate in this. Um, as a docent in training, you will receive education on the operations of the biological station, the research, the prairie, the activities that we offer, the hands-on science activities that we offer. You will get information on how to effectively communicate with the public and how to identify the different species of tall grasses. Our philosophy, we wish for our visitors to appreciate and understand the biology, geology, and history of the tall grass prairie, specifically Kansa Prairie. We also hope to instill a greater understanding of the scientific research accomplished here. Hopefully along the way, the visitors will have a great time. And that's, okay, the next page, what you can expect that you're gonna receive training. Um, if we're investing our time and energy into you, we hope that you will give it back as a volunteer. It's, it's I think, a reasonable expectation. Uh, docent training is just the beginning of your education. You can expect to continually learn new things throughout your tenure. And we, we often will have guest speakers who will come and share <coughs> information with you, and oftentimes we'll have researchers come and talk. Um, many of you come from that world and, and completely understand that uh, you know, a lot of researchers have a lot of things going on. And one other thing about researchers is they know how to talk about their research. And so your job is to then take the little nuggets of information from that and distill that down. We host over 4,000 visitors annually, with 60% of them being school children. The docents lead the vast majority of these visits. Haley and I, we couldn't do this. You guys do this. And you get to then shape the experience your way. We, we give you that freedom. We tell you, this is, this is what they want to do. This is where they're going to go. You, here's your group. You have an hour and a half. We'll see you when you get back. And so you get to shape it the way you think it might best work. So you've got some freedom there. Many of our visitors, especially children, have never set foot on the tall grass prairie. They've never been on the prairie. They don't know why the prairie is cool. They think mountains are cool. Why is the prairie cool? So, keep that in mind. You do not need to know everything. <laughs> you do not need to know everything or feel like an absolute expert in all facets of concept. Good grief, there's no one. I, I don't know, I certainly don't know everything. Not even Ken knows everything. <laughs> That's a gross understatement. <laughs> um, new docents are encouraged to spend time observing seasoned docents. That's what you and Mary are, Ken. You're seasoned. Thank you. You're, you're salty. You're salty. You're salty. You're salty. Feel free to observe as many activities as you wish once you feel comfortable in your role as a docent while you lead. So don't ever feel like I'm throwing you to the wolves, because I will not. You'll get to just hang with somebody as long as you want. Contra Prairie Biological Station fact sheet. There's just some basic information on that. We'll be talking more about those things, so I'm going to just slide past that. The uh, list of folks and their contact information. So the people that are running the place and their names. So there's that on the back side of that. The long-term ecological research. So, okay, so the organization out here, 
Kansa Prairie Biological Station is the site. Under this We have research. So research, 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 different groups doing research. But the biggest, the biggest research group is the LTER. That is our biggest research group. And that if you look at the back side of that page, it says long-term ecological research. Okay. Long-term ecological research is just that. It is research that is supposed to span large blocks of time. And it is funded by the National Science Foundation. Bless you. There are other LTER sites scattered across the country. Right now there are 28 of them. And they are intended to be located at sites that are in ecological peril. Where, whether it's a coral reef or um, the, we have the, who worked at Hubbard Brook? Was that you? No. Yeah, you know, at the, the, the deciduous forest at Hubbard Brook. We have. That's um, in New Hampshire. Yes. Yeah. We have uh, the Rocky Mountain Steppe. We have, oh, we have three in. Now two in Antarctica, three in the Arctic. You know, they're, they're, they're scattered around. And each one of those sites, well, and they do long term. The one here at Consa Prairie, Tall Grass Prairie, one of the most imperiled, no, let me back it up, the most imperiled terrestrial ecosystem on the planet. The LTER site has been here since 1980. It was one of the original founding LTER sites when this program started. And so it's very influential, and the folks that work there and run it are influential with our group. And they have, you know, they have researchers, and they have education. And that's me, and Haley, and you guys. KPBS also has researchers, but KPBS also has education. And again, that's us. So we have kind of a dual role. We work with the LTR and we also work with KPBS. So some of our activities are specific LTR activities and some of our activities are not. And the LTER activities are where the kids do science and collect data. And it's activities that mimic the ones that the researchers are doing. Mm -hmm. Um, KPBS rules of the site, that is just a referral for you to look at. You will, as a graduated docent, you will have permission to come out here and go, enter into the bison area. You get to have, you can go out there twice a year and take your family. There's gravel road and then there's dirt road, and the dirt roads are especially, don't go on those when they're wet. All right. We're in the next section. We're in the Kanza Prairie section. And so this is material that's specific to the station. And we start off with, yeah, we're on, the, we're on the dark green tab. And we have the colored watershed map. And the watershed map just shows you Kanza Prairie and how it is divvied up. It is one large experiment. It is one large experiment the, with about 50 different watersheds. And the watershed is an elevation, a hill. So the, the borders are at the top of the hill, and then the watersheds whoop, down to the middle of the valley. And that's all of those hills whoop, going down to the valley. That's one watershed. And then the one next door, another hill whoop, down to the valley. That's another watershed. And you get to say that with the kids. It's watershed. You have to go, whoop, because then they get it. <laughs> That's the water going down the hill. There's 50 of them. And each one is part of an experiment. They are divvied up with specific burn, 
slash fire treatments and specific grazing treatments. Some of them are grazed by cattle, some of them are grazed by bison, some of them are ungrazed. So we've got three choices there. Cattle, bison, or nobody. And then from that, some of them are burned every year, also called an annual burn. Some of them are burned every other year, we also call it a biennial burn. Some of them are burned every four years, and it's the bad ones, so burned every 20 years. Those are bad. Why are those bad? Who's the burn? Invaders. What? Uh, what did they say? are invaded with woody vegetation. Oh. So they, and that's one of our biggest stories, is if you don't burn the prairie, it doesn't stay a prairie. It turns into the forest. Mm -hmm. And once the forest gets established, it is incredibly difficult to bring it back. So. Was the 20 year side burned recently? Like in the last? Yeah. Seven? Yeah. Yeah. Did it actually burn? Yeah. See, that's exactly the point. And the answer is it was burned. Yeah. It really burned. And so if you want to bring it back, it takes chemical or mechanical mm -hmm. treatment. And or a fire on a day like today. Or a <laughs> super hot yeah. fire, which is not not something that we're going to really be able to do. Yeah. So, okay. So you can see all the watersheds there. The bison are in the green watersheds. All of the watersheds that have the prefix N, that N refers to native grazer. So that's where the bison are. They're in like the center. The watersheds that are blue, those are part of the Kings Creek watershed system. Kings Creek is the creek, one of the creeks that originates on Kansa Prairie, and that is the creek that we go to to do our stream activities. Mm -hmm. And because this creek originates on Kansa Prairie, the water that comes off of those watersheds is very clean because we do not use any kind of fertilizers, insecticides, or herbicides, and so we don't have runoff of agricultural chemicals into the water, and as such, we see that that water is very clean. And so we tell the kids that, and we're like, okay, so let's test it. Do you take my word for it, or should we test it and see? And so we've got two activities that, that test it. We have stream chemistry, and we have stream macroinvertebrates. And the macroinvertebrates is really cool, because they collect the bugs and the larva from the water, and then they bring them in here, and you can see. And then they put them under the dissected microscope, and shoot them on, and, and look at them. And they get to see dragonfly larvae, and it's really cool, because they look like little, little baby dragons. And I've got four of these. So the kids are, the kids are seeing this stuff, and they're just, their world just explodes. Uh, the Shane Creek area, I have a hole poked in it. How are those? Uh, What's the marking for Shane Creek? It, it is not. Oh, there's no. The, it's the, it's it's the, the C over on the right, that is the cattle. Cattle. The C is the cattle. But Shane Creek has no designation. Correct. Correct. So Shane Creek, ML knows this because she's a, she's a neighbor. The Shane Creek watershed is over there on the east side in the C in the red watersheds. So it's cattle? For the cattle. And that is a patch burn. And if you're not familiar with that process, that is a large pasture that is divided into three sections, but it's not fenced. So the three sections are like on a map, but the cattle don't see the three sections. But one third of that area is burned every year. So it might be this one's burned this year, then this one's the second year, and this one's the third year. With the idea that the cattle go to the freshly burned areas because that's where you've got a lot of protein rich new growth. But the birds, like the prairie chickens, are over in the old growth stuff that hasn't been burned for a couple of years. So it's, it's a management tool to allow for the existence of other organisms besides just cattle. And we're seeing this started in 2011, the patch burn system. We've got two replicates there. We have C3SA, C3SB, and C3SC. That is one. Then we have C3A, 
C3B and C3C, that's the other one, and then we have controls, that's C1A and C1B are controls. What's interesting is we're seeing how the prairie chickens in particular respond to that, because the prairie chickens, other than, are we good here? The prairie chickens, other than this patch burn area, the prairie chickens are not managed here on Kansa Prairie. If you're not familiar with prairie chickens, we get three of them there on the mantle. They're, that is the greater, three uh, male greater prairie chickens. They're really not managed on this site other than this patch burn. We have them. We have them down there in the southeast corner. There between, if you take a look, we have R1B, which is green on the south east corner, and 2D, if you look at the watershed divider between those, that's where the luck is. And we've been seeing, we've been seeing prairie chickens there, but we've also been seeing prairie chickens just within the last couple of years in the patch burn area, which is completely logical. Um, history of Common Prairie Biological Station. If you get a chance, read that. There's some homework for you. History of the Dewey Ranch, because this used to be an old cattle ranch. It became Common Prairie in entirety in 19, January of 1979. If you recall, we became part of the LTER in what year? 19. 1980. Okay, so jumped right in. Is that when the LPR started? Or? It is. So it was one of the first. One of the first. There were six. Yep, and one of them. Um, the Nature Trail, I think you've all indicated that you have been on the Nature Trail. On the Nature Trail, there is an old Swedish homestead with a barn, a limestone barn, and a spring house. We have a brief history of that homestead, the Hilkinson homestead. And we will talk more about that because we will, we will hike the nature trail. We have the fire ecology fact sheet, which is some general information on fire. The code orange sheet. If you are interested in becoming part of the fire crew, you are welcome to do that. Uh, you can go along on the prescribed burns, and then these are the people involved with the fire. Uh, they just had the fire crew training this last Saturday, but I've got it recorded and it's on the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I'll show you that in a second. So it can be replicated. And then the last sheet here of this section is a description of the LTER. And the LTER has its own website, and that's what this page is from. And the address is there at the bottom of that page. We're not going to go through the whole binder because that's boring. But I will tell you, if you take a look at the first sheet of the keep, go to the third tab. This one sheet summarizes what we do. Remember, keep, you're going to see that acronym a lot, CONSA, Environmental Education Program, activities available to school groups. Uh, we do a lot of hikes, guided hikes along the nature trail. We have a second trail to our west that is not public. We call it Butterfly Hill, and it is a beautiful trail. It's the one we use for our wildflower walk, if you've done that. And it is, it is an easy walk for especially the young, well, there's a good hill, and if the kids are energetic, you just make them run up the hill. It's the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're not going to get hurt running up. Um, and it's really pretty, and they get to the top of the hill, and they can oftentimes see the bison, and they have really nice vistas. So Butterfly Hill is a great hike. We have a third hike, which is just to the north of Butterfly Hill, and that is West Loop. And the West Loop goes over by a lot of the research, the local headquarters research things. And we have maps and explanations of that later. Um, so we have hikes. We have, if you look at the bottom of the page, you see the phrase, the Kanza experience. 
The Kanza experience is an activity in conjunction with the Flint Hills Discovery Center, which is the museum in Manhattan that is dedicated to the history, biology, and ecology of the, the Flint Hills. And so it's a logical combination for kids to visit that museum, and we prefer that they go to the museum first. We give them a worksheet. They have to find the answers to that worksheet among the displays. And they, these answers are, are things that are, you know, what is the name of the gray rock that provides the name of this area? Okay, you know, and, and find you know, what's got the longest root system of the tall grasses. They've got, and then they come out here. They have lunch and they come out here. And we then take them up to the top of Butterfly Hill and say, okay, here's the real thing. And then they come back and do the second half of the worksheet. We do not let them carry that worksheet with them because it would go mm -hmm. around and they'd be like writing stuff down in the worksheet and be completely distracted. We just, the, the docents look at the worksheet and say, okay, we need to talk about Flint. We need to talk about the grasses. We need to talk about the bison things that you would talk about anyway. And then when they get back, it's been all reinforced, and they've got it. And it, it's, it's half an hour up, half an hour back, 15 to 20 minutes doing the worksheet. They've just reinforced everything they did at the museum, and they've got it. Boom. It's easy. Okay. Um, specialized types on this back page of that sheet. Watching wildlife is a wonderful activity. This is where we take them from the creek, up through the shrublands, up to the high prairie, and we teach the kids how to pay attention. They're in groups of three, and one kid in the group is the listener, one group is the seer, or one kid is the seer, and one kid is the documenter. And they, they just listen for how many different sounds, they don't have to identify them, just listen. And they look for how many different how many different animals can they see? And they, they just count them. And then they go from the creek to the shrubland, and then they trade places. The one who is listening is now looking. The one who is writing down is now listening. You know, they all trade places. And they notice that they can hear different things at different places. And they can see different things at different places. And they get up to the high prairie, suddenly they can't hear a thing. All they hear is wind, and they can, but they can see the vultures. They couldn't see the vultures down by the creek, but you can see the vultures, but you can't hear anything. And it's a great lesson. They figured it out. If you stop, you can hear stuff. And if you just stop, you can see stuff. And the things change as you go up the hill. It's a very cool thing, and those kids come back feeling so enabled, they want to bring their family out and then they want to be the leaders, which is, again, boom, we've done our job. The driving tour. We have an hour and a half driving tour around the bicycle. And this is a lot of fun. The kids love it because, you know, talk about charismatic mammal. And a lot of them are, you know, the bison are wild. They are not domestic. They're, they're wild. But they're show-offs. And they get to see the high prairie, and they get to see the watersheds, and how watersheds that are burned every year have lots of grass. Watersheds that are burned over 20 years don't have so much grass. Boom. They figure it out. Then we have the hands-on, the S-L-T-E-R. Anytime you see that acronym. Schoolyard. Long-term ecological research. And then custom activities, um, we will, if, if a teacher comes to us and says, I really want to do something on weather, okay, we will put something together. I really want to do something on, Haley, help me out, do we have any um, mammals or insects or, you know, we will, we will customize something for them. And those are always fun because it allows us to stretch out a little bit. Uh, I will show you our website. We have a YouTube channel, the Kanza Prairie channel, and I'll show you that here in a second. Jeff, I'm just going to ask, when a school group, do they get in touch with you directly and then they kind okay, of... Okay, so process. 
of how, how this happens. Yeah. That's Haley. You want to take it from there? You want to tell everything? Yeah, happens? so school groups will call in um, and then we'll set something up um, and we'll get it organized in our office. And then um, from there, we'll put out a, I'll say a call, but it's not an actual phone call to get docents. We'll have it on the website and I'll probably send out an email. Mm -hmm. We're kind of um, changing some things around right now, but, um, and then we'll say, you know, if you're available on this date, you'd like to come. You can just sign up online and volunteer to come out then and leave the group. And you know by that time, like, what what kind of program? Yeah, absolutely. Doing? Before we put that out to the docents, we would know what, how many students they have, what grade they're in, what activities they want to do, what time they're coming. Cool. So. Typically, how many docents do you have for a group? Uh, do, do it on the ratio of docents to students? Or? Yeah, and different activities will have different ratios. If it's a hike, it's 10 students per docent. Um, and then some of our more specialized things, like watching wildlife, there's one um, docent for every three students. So it'll vary in that way, and we'll put out the number that we need. So we'll say we're, we're looking for 10 docents for this day, from this time to this time. Cool. Yeah. One to 10 is your working, working ratio. I have another question about the nature trail. So. I know there's been an issue about the uh, public coming in and abusing that trail. And I wonder, mm -hmm. do docents play a role in, in uh, keeping an eye on people? They can, there, yeah. Helping people understand what they're seeing and how to behave while they're out they, there? They can. That's, that's completely um, mm -hmm. optional for docents. And I have, I have vests that docents can wear and go out on their free time. Yeah. Well, because half, half, of the, half the job is being a recognizable representative of Cons Prairie. And so I have green canvas vests because a lot of people see green as kind of you know, like a park service, forest service kind of thing. And so it's that color. And they wear the vest and it says Nature Trail Guide on the back and on the front. And so automatically, boom, you are an authority. And so if you want to wear that while you're out walking, a lot of docents do that. Um, some docents want to go incognito. Okay. But if you want to wear the vest, and then and I'll, you'll all get one, um, a lot of people will wear the vest while they're doing their, uh, their hikes with the kids, too. But yes, we do, we do hope that the docents will hike the trail and do that. I followed news reports about you know, some of the struggle. Around. I know that the uh, KPBS or whoever put up a, a gate out there to uh, yep. control entry on weekends, and people came and broke it. Yeah. And did some things like that. Yeah. So uh, there's really, a, and if we want to keep that open, it needs to be protected. Thank so, you. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's part of protecting it might be being out there with the recognition. It helps. It helps uh, to have have the visibility. It certainly does. And we kind of start all over every year, and it's always right about this time because when we have the first really nice day of the year, everyone mm -hmm. comes out. And that's when you start seeing people who are new to the area may bring their dogs or may bring a blanket or a frisbee or whatever. You know, this is not a park. And you know, that's another part of this. This is not a public site. This is owned, actually. You probably know this. It's owned by the Nature Conservancy. The Nature Conservancy, it's, a, it's in the history, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow. Uh, but the Nature Conservancy pur purchased this at the behest of a Kansas State University professor to use for tall grass prairie research because he saw that the tall grass prairie was really disappearing. And so as such, it's not public, but there is a public section, and that is the nature trail. And so people who come out think, well, this is a park. You know, well, mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll come out and do whatever, bring our dogs because we have a right. Well, no, we don't. No. But, but neither do we want to, you know, we want the public to come out, we want them to enjoy it, but we don't want them to get upset. You know, so it's how, how to communicate that with tact. And so, another fine line. And what about bikes? People biking out here? Yeah, I've seen them. And so we ask. I've seen dogs too. Yeah. And I know it's a real no no. Well, and they've gone the by like four, four or five bikes. times. Yeah. So. <laughs> It's kind of blatant once once they've gone past all the signs because yeah. people say, "Well, more signage." Well, mm, it's a big one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that, yeah. that trail goes through some pretty sensitive research sites, right? Like the, well, there's the there's state. a there's a couple of issues. The there do there are people that do research, but there's a lot of times they don't in reality because people can mess with it. Yeah. 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 Y
but the creek is especially one that we want to keep people out of. We can go in because we're not dumping stuff in there, but the creek is pretty sensitive. Uh, the, the researchers try to keep the research away from the public areas just to avoid that interference. I, I walked the trail two or four times a week when I was walking all of this, especially when we were having a lot of dog problems a year and a half ago. And I only had a couple dogs and they left. Some people get very agitated and won't leave. But, uh, it does really help. And there a lot of people, they see, they see your best or whatever. And, they want to learn about the fire and about the prairies, and I think it's a really good thing to go out there and just and it helped me lose 30 pounds, <laughs> which I put back on this winter. Okay, so you are in the classroom, so vernacular. You are in the classroom of the Hulbert Center. Also known as the Stone House or the Ranch House. We have this room, and then the room you came in on is dedicated for school groups. So this is one of the main reasons why we can only have so many kids. <laughs> We're limited by our soccer space. Mm -hmm. We we can get 45 kids in these two rooms. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I'll show you what that looks like. I'm going to show you a video of that. It gets really loud because of the stone house. Of Cons Prairie Biological Station. And taking a look at this, you know, we've got the prairie cone flowers. So this is a view. Late May, early June, you probably are doing that. Look soft, but and you know we're and we're not going to get the tall grasses. And this is a common question. It might seem completely logical to you, but they, we, this is a common question for folks coming out here. They're like, you know, in May, like, where's the tall grasses? Come back in September. We'll show you the tall grasses. They're not. They're going to be short until then. But do you have anything to do with that tall grass prairie down south? Pardon me? The tall grass pear preserve that's down south of here. Do we have anything to do with that? No. Um, yes, they're both owned by the Nature Conservancy. Oh, okay. And so it's it's the same folks. Um, they're relatively new, mm -hmm. and so we have kind of worked with them to help them get their education program started. Uh, but it's still, that's about, we, we will send, for people who want um, to go see bison, we don't offer really public tours of the bison. We offer school group tours, but not public tours. This is our airtight building. Mm -hmm. um, we send them down there to see bison. There we go. History. This is the original range of the tall grass prairie in Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, Minnesota, the eastern Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas. And just taking a look at where it is now, this is what's left. Um, and it's pretty obvious that any of this going to work. There we go. And we've got the Flint Hills being a major portion of the existing tall grass prairie. And that's simply because, well, we'll get to that here in a second. Um, but we tell the kids, that's one of the major stories that we tell the kids, is that you know, the tall grass prairie, having that here is a very special thing. And then I put the onus back onto them, like, what happened to all the other tall grass prairie in, say, in Iowa? and in Missouri and in Illinois, what happened to it? And that gets them thinking. <clears throat> like, um, it's destroyed. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's growing other kinds of tall grasses. So what is it growing? And that really blows their minds. <laughs> like, how about corn? You know, and corn really is just a tall grass. <laughs> so it, it gets them thinking. And rather than me telling them everything, they start answering. Uh, the numbers tell us that it's around 4% of the original tall grass prairie remains. So 96% of it <coughs> has been transferred into farmland and uh, residential land. 
there is. Less than 4% of the original range of the tall grass prairie remains. Largest continuous remaining area is in the Flint Hills. Which you can see, and a lot of the kids don't realize this, that the Flint Hills extends down into Oklahoma, where they no longer call it the Flint Hills. What do they call it? You guys know this one? The Osage. Yeah, exactly. The Osage Hills. I'd call it Little Kuwait, too. No. Little Kuwait. Okay. That, is that a political state? Or why do they call it political Kuwait? Well, that's... Because it looks like Kuwait? That's where the Oklahoma oil was. Oh, oh, gotcha, oh. gotcha. And Ponca City and everything used to be like Kuwait. Nice. So there's where Contra Prairie is in the grand scheme of things. We also have a map of the Flint Hills over <laughs> here on our west wall. I, I'm guessing a lot of you have seen this map before, maybe. You know, with that same arrowhead type shape, and then we've got a sticker here indicating where Kansa Prairie is there. And you can see the relatively mesic portions versus the relatively dry portions. Okay, so what saved the Flint Hills? There it is, and you can really see it in April, which is when this picture was taken. The Flint Hills has rich soil, but the steep, rocky slopes and the shallow upland soils made it impossible to plow. So our rocks saved it, um, which doesn't mean that we have the world's best prairie. And that's another thing that blows our minds. As we say, you know, especially for the spring roots, like, take a look at the hills. What do you see? We see rocks. Well, would you want to plow that? Like, no. It would break your plow. Exactly. And this is why this prairie still remains. Is this the world's best prairie? Like, it's not. It's not. We have shallow soil. The world's best prairie? <laughs> Over here. <laughs> yeah. Really thick soil it's in somebody's cornfields. Some of the best tall grass prairie are corners of cemeteries. If you want to see some really good stuff, go to the corners of cemeteries or some of the smaller uh, protected areas. That's where you really get good stuff. We, we do have intact tall grass prairie, but it is uncharacteristically shallow soil. Not to diss it, but that's just that's the reality of it. <coughs> so. <coughs> Three major factors interact to maintain prairies, and this is one of the major lessons that we impart onto the students, and it forms the foundation of our research. Climate, fire, do you know the third one? Weather, rain, or animals. Climate. Yeah. Grazing animals. There it is. Grazing animals. And my, by the way, my picture is better than that one. <laughs> <laughs> Just say it. Yeah, and so this forms the foundation of our research here. We look at the interactions of these things and how they affect the plants, how they affect the bison, how they affect uh, the water in the stream, and then the organisms living in the stream, how it all interacts, and how, uh, how the rainfall affects the plant growth, which affects the fire intensity. It's all connected. So yeah, first. how are uh, the watersheds that are not grazed, then, so how are they maintained as grasslands? Because that's, that's a simple question. I You'll see do. this. You'll see this when you go out there. Because what happens in a grazed pasture is that the bison will, and cattle, well, bison more, but they, both of them will selectively graze. They eat the stuff that tastes good. They don't eat the stuff that doesn't taste good. And the stuff that doesn't taste good is going to be the stuff that burns, right? Because it's standing and it's fuel. And so the stuff that burns leaves an area that the, the, the good stuff can now grow in. <laughs> and so it becomes a constantly changing mosaic pattern of grasses and wildflowers. And here's a term that, that you may or may not know, and that is a forb. 
a Forb, which is F is in Frank, O-R-B. The Forbs are the wildflowers, the non-grassy plants, mm -hmm. the non-grassy herbaceous plants. And so it's a constant mosaic and changing of the grasses and the Forbs. And what happens is the bison will eat the grasses and the Forbs will then dominate because the grasses that would have been dominant have been grazed down. In the non-grazing area, guess what dominates? The grasses. So the non-grazing area looks like your, your picture, postcard, perfect prairie because it's these waving grasses with very few forbs. So you actually get more flowers. The simple answer is you get more flowers where there's grazing. And you get fewer flowers where there's no grazing. But, okay, let's go <clears throat> So what good is a flower forest? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what good is a flower? Why would we want, why would we care? Unless it imparts something to the soil or something. Or something. Sure. sure. Okay. Diversity. Sure. Diversity, yes. Sure. Diversity. Is that a good thing? So you're getting a hint of what I do with the kids. Mm -hmm. You guys probably know, you know, what, what, what makes a good prairie? Okay, so a good prairie, it's, it's a dynamic thing. It, you want to have a mix. It depends on who you're talking about. <laughs> Are you a nematode? Are you a bison? Are you a cattle rancher? Are you, are you a butterfly? Are you a bumblebee? It depends on your point of view. If you're a prairie chicken, you want grass to put tall enough to put your nest so you don't you don't get so your mm -hmm. eggs don't get eaten by a raccoon and so your chicks have cover and don't get killed by a harrier. So it, it, it all depends. Diversity, the ecologist will tell you that the biodiversity is a good thing. And but it's funny, when you go out to the prairie and you see these waving grasses, they're like, oh, that's such a pretty prairie. Like, well, what are we seeing here? And it's all part of the lesson, it depends. Personally, I like, I like to see wildflowers. And I like to see <coughs> pollinators. A little bit of history, begun in 1971 by Dr. Lloyd Holbert. The name of the building is the Holbert Center. You're gonna see that name a lot. He is the KSU professor who asked for money. And um, many of you have been professors and you know that asking for money is always you know, a really easy thing, right? Mm -hmm. You just go to the administrators like Ken and say, give me some money. And Ken says, "Absolutely." let me write the check. <laughs> so he started in the <laughs> mid-50s, started in the mid-50s looking for appropriate ranches and found a couple of ranches that he liked, went to the administration, the administration says, are you kidding me? And said, you need to work with the foundation, and the foundation tried to find something. And the Nature Conservancy in the mid-50s in Kansas was non-existent. The Nature Conservancy in the mid-60s was nascent, just getting started. They came up with enough money to buy this little bottom tab here at the bottom. If you've got your binder open, take a look at the watershed map. It was the beginning of the, of the darker green. There it is. Look at the bottom of the, of the watershed map, and you're gonna see a whole bunch of itty bitty little watersheds. That was the first Hans Prairie. 900 acres there at the bottom. The Nature Conservancy did indeed purchase that. They gave the money to the foundation. So the actual owner of this little tab down here is the Kansas State University Foundation. Lloyd Holbert and his group of fellow faculty managed that and realized that these itty bitty little watersheds were being impacted by the bigger watersheds to the north. And said, you know, our, our little tab here is nice but we'd really like everything else. <laughs> is that a problem? 
Um, and the Nature Conservancy found a donor, same donor, gave up several million dollars as a single donation to the Nature Conservancy, anonymous, to purchase the rest. Because this, this ranch, this Dewey Ranch, came up for sale. The owner said, I'll take exchange for some land in Oklahoma, so if you guys buy this, you can have it. And the Nature Conservancy bought it for $3.9 million. And that happened in January of 1979. And this all, and then a, a, another third purchase over here on the west. And I need to look at the, at the historical, I think it's the Tiley Ranch came in. And so the, the entire Ponza Prairie of 8,616 acres came together January of 1979. Very few people care about all of that. Um, but what's interesting is the fact that that single donor, her name was, she passed away that same year, 1979. Her name was Catherine Ordway. Mm -hmm. And she got her money, her personal wealth came from the 3M. Company. Her father was one of the founders <coughs> of the 3M company out of Minnesota. Minnesota Mines and Millions. What? Millions? Mines and Manufacturing. Mines and Manufacturing. But she was a great lover of the prairie. And so she wanted to save this prairie. And what's interesting is there's, and her last name is Ordway. Uh, there's Ordway prairies scattered all over the Midwest. There's Ordway prairies in Minnesota, there's Ordway prairies in South Dakota and in North Dakota. She, she single-handedly, this is the power of a single person, single-handedly helped save prairie in multiple places. Her one request for this particular purchase is that the area be given a Native American name or a name reflective of a Native American <coughs> culture. And they originally wanted to call this, uh, after the Kaw Indian tribe, they wanted to call this the Kansa Prairie, K-A-N-S-A. -A. But the, the administrators at Kansas State said, eh, it's gonna, everyone's going to think we're misspelling Kansas. I said, well, why don't we just do a derivation of that? And K-O-N-Z-A was a derivation of that. So the, the Kansa people or the Kansa people was the Native American connotation or reflection requested by Catherine Wardway. Um, there's a question as to whether if she ever came here and saw it. Uh, there, I think there was a secret trip made in 1978 where she flew in privately and was met by an administrator. You might know this. Mm -hmm. Met by an administrator who was the uh, vice president of something, maybe of research. I brought her out here for a private tour, and then she flew out. Mm -hmm. So she may have seen it once. I have a real quick question. I was at the Capitol a couple weeks ago. The friend and the K-State students were um, had a big uh, display of different research that they've been doing. And I think one young gentleman had, are there burial sites on the concept? No. OK. There's, I, there, uh, no, people okay. had their ashes scattered, but there's not burial okay. sites. Well, I didn't know if he, just where he was saying maybe the same. We have a close. memorial. We have a Holbrook okay. memorial. Okay. He's not buried no, there. No, it was just something, a uh, different research he did. I don't know how I got it. Okay. Was Native American burial sites? Or I think it, it, maybe he was just, no, Native American sites. I didn't know if they were close or if maybe he used the word Kanza and I was thinking on the Kanza prairie somewhere or... Right, and you see that that name used a lot. Yeah, okay. I don't think we're right. Okay, maybe that's where he did his research. Hey, Joe. Do you know Kelly. about where the scenic overlook off of one seventy seven is on that one? Right there. It's like the worst place ever to put a scenic overlook because you get there and you think, oh, look at all this. And you're looking at trees. If you wanted to see the prairie, right, you'd be right there. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the scenic overlook. Not so much, <laughs> in my opinion. I would. Yeah, it's it's yeah. pretty. Would yeah, you're yeah. looking at the river, yeah. but you're not looking at Kanza. Yeah. You have to look crane to go this way. So, so to, to the right of uh, that is the Reynolds Ranch. Yes. Right? 
Yep. So that's another huge expense of land that was donated pretty recently, right? Yeah. Was it donated? Uh, I think so. I don't know. It's uh, it's uh, certainly managed by K-State. There's a lot of research that goes on over there. Well, I wonder maybe um, that's what you're saying. Maybe. <coughs> Suddenly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know there's oh. research that happens over here, but I... Clinton I thought it was... Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Most okay. Stuff. I thought it was private. But... So we are here. We're on the far northwest corner. And so you can see the roads. And what's interesting, here's where the bison are. Look at how it looks different yeah. from out here. Bison, no bison. And then yeah. look over here, cattle, no cattle. Mm -hmm. You can see, forbs, grasses. Mm. Where's the nature trail? Right there. There's the creek. And the nature trail will go all the way out to here. Actually, yeah, all the way out to here. So if you do the full six mile loop, you can see the Shane Creek Road here. And you'll get to know the Shane Creek Road. So just again, the 50 watersheds, 50 or so watersheds, these are the ones that have been designated as annual burns. Burned every other year, or biennial burns. This is the patch burn, so you can see they burned every three years. Burn every four years, start to see the shrubs in those, and then the really bad ones burned every 20 years. What's interesting, if you're feeling ambitious, you can get on the nature trail. This is the third loop. This is the Godwin Hill loop. And you can see that we are starting to fight back. We're, we're physically, with brush hogs and chainsaws, physically removing the shrubs, the eastern red cedars, the smooth sumac, and the roughly dogwood. And you can see what it looks like. And we also had, it kind of started because we had a really hot fire go through there a couple of years ago. And we got encouraged. <laughs> so now we're like, well, let's just keep going and see what we can do. And it's starting to come back. It's really interesting. Well, explain that a little bit. Yeah, we, because it's like, you know, if we had a 20 year fire rotation, then, you know, I would think you'd only have to go through just to understand how really bad that is for the prairie. I mean, if I remember listening to Lloyd back in the 80s. He said, we needed the evidence to really convince people. But the evidence is very clear these days, right? So are we saying that we don't need to do the 20 years anymore? There's a lot of contention, ah. and there's not agreement. We have researchers that want to keep the 20-year burn rotation present, and to not, because all of these have been burned recently. Okay, so we've already done the 20-year burn, and right. so Ostensibly, we would wait another 20 years to burn it. However, however, one of the there's there's three requirements handed down by the Nature Conservancy for use of this land. Okay, so Kansas State University and the LTER are not owners of the land. They're they're managing the land. The management of the land is being done by the Division of Biology and also through the LTER system. Mm -hmm. okay. The three tenets are that this land should be used for education, for research, and for prairie conservation. So are we conserving the prairie mm -hmm. yeah. by keeping this from being burned? Yeah. But we have researchers within the LTER that want to see what happens when we don't burn it for another 20 years. So with how many 20-year cycles have we been through? We've been through one. <laughs> and look what happens, two? No, just one. And if, for some of these, they, let them, they, let, they, they didn't burn them. They didn't burn them after the first 20 years. They waited too long. Well, they waited longer than 20 years. Okay, so, so the question now becomes, what does it take to get it back? 
it takes money. And that's one thing that the state of Kansas does not have, is a lot of money. But we have passionate people working here who have a little bit of free time and a chainsaw, and they're just going ahead and doing it because we had, seriously, because this is the nature trail. This is not really a research area. And so because we had a really hot fire go through here, it took out a bunch of the eastern red cedars. They, they have permission to go out there and clean it out. And so it's doing our hearts good to see that it can be done. Okay. But you'll see when we go out here that this is a mess, that's a mess, and this is just full of eastern red cedars. This little heart-shaped one is very distinctive. Well, it's going to actually make it more difficult for those four-year and three-year I mean, it's a big seed source right next to them. It's a huge seed source. Yeah, no. And when you're surrounded by seeds, it's very difficult to keep things from germinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not really reflective of a natural prairie to have, you know, so the question becomes, what part of this is a natural prairie? And it, 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 you could certainly debate both sides. Are hotter fires more likely in those dense woody areas? No. Mm -hmm. No, they're not going to get hot because they're not going to catch the fire. So it was for just kind of luck that it was it was a strong south wind, and it it built up after the fire had already started, and it actually jumped and went over here, mm -hmm. creating the situation. Mm -hmm. But in retrospect, in retrospect, we were like, this is this this did good things, mm -hmm. and we'll go out there and look at it. It looks pretty good. Is there any? I'll get probably here later. I'll I'll try to wait. <laughs> Do you want to ask? Are you going to remember? It just seems, I've always thought that it's such a patchwork of treatments on this site that comparing the diversity of organisms of all kinds associated with prairie and ecotone areas and everything, compared to say, down at the Prairie National Park, which doesn't have quite this kind of, you know, mosaic, it would seem like a really good LTDR uh, research problem. Taking a look at the ecotones. Well, especially if these folks are wanting to keep the 20 year cycle going because that's just going to, mm -hmm. it's going to be weed trees for 100 years, but maybe after 100 years it won't be weed trees. Maybe it'll be chinkin' up folks. Mm -hmm. Who your neighbor is is really going to affect the results, so mm -hmm. it might be interesting to rotate them from time to time. But you have to decide when is the experiment done. And that's what we're, mm -hmm. that's what we're coming up with. When is the experiment done? And I, and yeah. I, I'm done with it. <laughs> You're not alone, bro. <laughs> this is an obvious thing, I guess, but these boundaries are not arbitrary, right? I mean, they are at the tops of the hills. Those are real geophysical sort they of They are features. geophysical hill, tops of the hills, yeah. So who mapped all of that out? Lloyd. Lloyd did. Well. Lloyd Holbert. If you go on Google Earth, look at it, and then go back on the time clock back to, to 19, and go back to 1984 on the concept, you can watch the progression of the trees across the entire concept on each of the burn sites. It's really quite interesting. That's on Google Earth? Is that yeah, they have a, you, know, you can go back in time. Some places you go back 60, <coughs> 70 years. Hmm. Yeah, you need to show me how to do that. Yeah. You can really show cool. us all how to do that. Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. <laughs> okay, so let's, we have some seasonal burns there on the, the southern aspect. We have the summer burns, which are burned in <coughs> July every other year. We would normally burn them every year, but when they're burned in July, their fuel source is removed and there's not enough built up by the next year to get enough fuel for a burn, so it's every other year. These are burned annually in the fall. These are burned annually in the winter, which is typically November. And these are burned annually in the spring. So these are some of the first watersheds set up with the seasonal burns. And the, the data shows us that you do get response to the seasonality of the burns. You get different species responding in different ways. Um, Forbes, the wildflowers especially, do not appreciate getting burned. They, if you want Forbes um, burning every other or every three years will really be the best for them. What about which season to burn? So I know there's been... So, so it doesn't really matter. Um, certain species of grasses will respond slightly differently. Uh, you could burn very effectively in the fall and very effectively in the winter if it's dry enough. 
and the one question about burning in the winter is whether it induces erosion problems. Well, except that the fire rarely gets hot enough to, to really impact vegetation below the soil, you know, and, and there really has not been any data to show that there's an erosion problem with the winter burn. The, the thick thatch of roots keeps the soil intact. So this is the overlaying of the bison. So you can see where the bison are with the different burn frequencies. Cattle are on the east side in the patch burn. And then the ungrazed are the remainders. And again, you can see the nature trail. This first part really, this is the main nature trail here. This is the lookout hill, the top of the hill. This is the road going down to the Hokinson home site. This is where the Hokinson home site is. So climate. We tell the kids that we have a continental climate. You've probably heard that before. Since we're in the, the center of the continent, we have highly variable, <laughs> highly variable weather. You know, so in the summer, it's going to get really hot, and in the winter, it's going to get really cold, and then you're going to have everything in between. So for about this day, the record high uh, in 1921 was 73. The record low was minus 12. Average high is about 47. Uh, predicted high, about 55. Highest ever temperature in Kansas, mm -hmm. regardless, is 116. Lowest ever, minus 31. Mm -hmm. So just showing the variability of our temperature. So this is the average high and the average low. Okay. With the overall average being 55 degrees. And how often do we hit that? Right there, maybe? <laughs> so that's just a function of being in the center of a continent away from the buffering effects of water. If we had a nice great lake somewhere nearby, we wouldn't be so crazy. And so here's the average annual rainfall. Again, not average. Really a lot or not much. But how often do we hit our average of 33 inches? The Palmer Drought <laughs> Index, taking a look at several factors, temperature, rainfall, water use by plants. We have an overall estimate of dryness or wetness. And you can see that it cycles. You know, we have extreme periods. Again, very rarely do we not have some kind of peak of some sort or valley. And that's just, again, that's normal for the center of the country. And this one, this is just an example of one of the research projects that we do here. These covered rainfall shelters or rain out shelters are simply covering the prairie and collecting the rain into these large black tubs. And we are simulating drought. We physically keep the rain off. With climate change models are showing us that the rain will come in fewer events, and when it does rain, it will be more extreme. So it will be a lot of rain, but with more time in between each event. And so we caught the water, and then after a period of 50% beyond when we normally had, for example, if we had rain, but then period of 30 days, we would wait until 45 days had elapsed and then we would put all of the rain onto the prairie. More extreme rain event with more time in between. And what we saw with this is that the prairie changed. The prairie responded. We had more switchgrass, we had less big blue stem, we had more goldenrod, we had fewer, fewer other species of, of flowers. The, the prairie completely changed. So the overall message is, with climate change, you're going to have high variability, or you're going to have a change in the prairie. Species respond. These rainout shelters are interesting in that within the last year, we've taken them all down, and now we're looking to see is 
how the prairie recovers from that. We've had those on for 30 years. Wow. Now we're looking to see what happens afterwards. The so fire, obviously a major component of our program out here historically, and this is a common question. You know, normally, what normally is the frequency of fire on a normal prairie? And it's really not documented, so we can just guess and say it's, it was about every three or four years, typically by wildfire or by fire started by Native Americans. Um, but again, this isn't normal out here. We're surrounded by seeds, as Brad pointed out. We're surrounded by seeds, we're surrounded by highways, we're surrounded by habitation. What is a normal prairie? We can say about every three or four years, as far as we can tell. Currently, many <coughs> landowners burn every year to promote growth, <coughs> growth for their cattle. Most ranchers aren't too interested about having um, forbs or wildflowers. So this is normal. This is what it looks like afterwards. You can see that it really didn't get very hot. We don't have, you know, we have kind of a, a black carbon-based ash, but just scrape a little bit under that and you're going to see healthy growing roots. So this is a mouse or a snake eye version of, of, of what it looks like. And if you are a mouse, or probably not a snake out at this point in, in the season, but if you're a little mouse, you are in deep trouble. <laughs> There's no cover. But very soon, Within about a week and a half, you've got this. And this equals happy bison. Mm -hmm. Protein rich, very edible, very soft, tasty, new growth. Um, and one thing that you can tell, and, and this is one thing that we, we tell the kids, you can, you can feel. Even with, when the grass gets pretty tall, you can feel when an area has been burned. So if the question is, has this area been burned recently? Well, it crunches. And plus, you don't have any dead stuff. All the dead stuff has been removed. All the golden, dried stuff is gone. So if it's just green, and it's kind of crunchy, as compared. If you're a mouse, this is a happy place. So unburned, burned. So increasing the frequency of fires increases the abundance of dominant warm season grasses. The warm season grasses are these guys in the corner, these tall grasses. Big blue stem, switchgrass, little blue stem, side oats grandma. They really start taking off in July when it's warm. Other grasses begin growing and grow the majority of their life in the spring when it's cool. So we call those cool season grasses. And we'll, we'll point those out as the season progresses. Frequency of fires decreases woody vegetation, but only if you burn before it gets its roots get down to permanent water. Once a shrub or a tree grows roots deep enough to access the permanent water, fire's not really going to take it out unless it's a really hot fire. Woody vegetation, once it gets established, meaning the roots reach the water, once it gets established, that protective bark is really going to protect it from fire. And it's hard to get rid of woody vegetation once it's established. The broadleaf plants, those are the forbs, and the cool season grasses, none of them really like fire. Fire decreases plant species diversity by decreasing the number of species in the area. It's kind of obvious. Grazing, normal for a prairie. Historically, bison, elk, pronghorn, and deer, although deer aren't grazers, but deer are browsers. They will eat leaves off of shrubs and trees, which is a little different from grazing the grass. So for most of the prairie, cattle take the place of the bison. And the cattle will eat the grass and leave the forbs. Cattle or bison were added to Consul Prairie in 1987. They came from Fort Riley herd. Um, Lloyd Colbert did not live long enough to see the bison come to Consul Prairie. He passed away in 1987. 
ironically, from lung cancer. Yeah. Uh, currently, we maintain a herd of about 300 animals. Right. Well, I should take it back. Right now, it's about 200, but it will soon be 300. Because what's going to happen? Babies. babies! About the first week in April, we expect the first mm -hmm. babies to show up. They have about 2,500 acres. They have the full reach of the dead area. They uh, are typically not supplementally fed. They remove about 25% of the annual net primary productivity. That means of, of what the plants grow, that growth in that year, the bison remove about a quarter of that growth for that year. When they do supplementals, when do they do that? If they do supplementals, only if we have severe winter. Mm -hmm. A severe winter and really thick snow, which is means anymore. Not very often. Mm -hmm. They didn't do it this year. I was always wondering because I was always under the impression I haven't researched in this for years, but I was always under the impression that the, our our prairie grass extended to load most of their nutritional value into the roots and there really wasn't a lot for the bison to eat during Absolutely. The Absolutely. Yep. They are right now yeah. they are yeah. on they are on uh, yeah. They're pretty skinny right now. And you'll see it. Okay. Yep. Um, and we lose to various factors whether it's illness, starvation, whatever, we lose maybe 1% annually. So normally when, when they graze, they will graze an area down to a lawn like that. Especially, you can see this is April. You know, they burn and this is the new stuff coming up and they will make it nice even lawn. And so the, the bison, Will, will graze on the grass and the forbs will grow and the next year the forbs will be the ones that burn and the grasses because they've been grazed down really don't provide any fuel for a burn. So you can see a patchwork mosaic. This is where the forbs were. So they burned. So this is where you're going to get growth. And so it will change over time. And so one other thing, people ask, how did the bison respond to fire? Are they freaked out? No. Nope. They barely even notice it because they're on the green grass and the green grass isn't going to burn. Hmm. They, they don't stampede, they don't run, they don't get wild eyed, they just move over. So grazing increases the habitats because we have different kinds of plants getting a toehold. Increased plant diversity means increased animal diversity. So grazing leads to diversity of both plants and animals. In the absence of grazing, you're going to have more dominant tall grasses like these guys and fewer of anything else. It's going to be a pretty prairie, but it's it's not functionally as healthy as with the presence of grazers. Bison versus cattle, both feed on dominant grasses. When management of the animals is similar, plant communities are also similar. So bison and cattle can be somewhat intermixed for grazing purposes. But their behavior is slightly different, especially around water. It's funny. Uh, so bison will graze intensively, cattle will graze more evenly, bison make wallows, cattle don't. Mm -hmm. Bison will, will rub up against the trees and basically destroy them, whereas cattle don't. And bison very rarely get too concerned about water. Uh, I had one of the researchers ask me to get a picture of a bison drinking from a wallow, because the wallows will fill with water and become, you know, not only water ponds, but also a, a little marsh. And he wanted me to get a picture of a bison drinking from a wallow. It was hard. 
They don't get too worried about water. They, you never see bison standing in water like cattle do. When it gets hot, cattle will go down to the bottom of a hill and stand in, a, stand in the water, right? Bison never do that. Bison go up to the top and let the wind blow. Completely different behavior when it comes to that. So putting our factors together, the variability of the weather leads to variable plant growth. So when we have lots of water, lots of rain, we get lots of plant growth. When we have low rain, we have relatively lower plant growth from year to year, from place to place, depending on grazing. The ungulate grazing and migration patterns differ, depends on where the grass is. So they move to where the food is which then completely affects the fire. So where there's fuel, the fire will burn. Where they've been grazing, the fire won't burn. And it, you know, if it rains, then you suddenly get a bunch of grass and it all moves. It's a constantly shifting dynamic. And they all interchange. And it all depends on one thing, water. And that's, one, that's another thing that we tell the kids. There's one aspect to the prairie management that affects everything. What do you think it is? Bison, uh, fire, I'm like, nope, go beyond that. What helps the plants grow? Rain. There's a Key State students put out on a little fair sometimes for our kids to learn at the zoo, and there's a bead game that they use for um, are you water or you know how many beads can you collect for water and fire and um, animals I think and it's interesting to see how that changes yeah with that game. it all it all comes down to how much rain we have okay so just showing us in, in just position to our neighbors and we can see areas that are burned frequently. We can see the green versus areas that are not burned frequently are inundated with woody vegetation. And then the egg fields down here. So just take a look. Google Maps can tell you a lot. I'm going to scoot through this because we've talked about this. Uh, the aquatic research. This is the this is the Kings Creek. Uh, drainage, and there's the creek here. So you can see how it originates. For the most part, we've got just a little bit over here on the neighbors, but for the most part, originates here on Kanza. And the water is very, very clean, and we do get really, really interesting macroinvertebrates as a result. It's a healthy place. Shea Creek, as you've been hearing, over here on the east side. There's the drainage. It is monitored as part of the patch burn grazing study. Effects of cattle under non-invasive stocking management. And this is just a map showing the LTER sites, how they're scattered. Arctic, they have, that's Puerto Rico, by the way, that station in Puerto Rico got completely wiped out. But, being researchers, they're like, okay, we're looking at the effects of disturbance. <laughs> Let's see, and they're they're kind of they're weirdly jazzed about it. They're like, we're gonna see what happens. Like, okay, you guys are sick. But but they need to find money to build their new buildings. Uh, yeah. So what's what's really interesting is we all come together every every three years. We all come together and and we share things. So that's one thing that we that we will probably be working on is how to get kids connected to other LTER sites and maybe have a common research project. How does Kanza tie in with other grassland uh, sites around the world? We do. Like in Africa. No. Uh, we have researchers that do research in Africa and so there is joint projects going on. In, in the United States, we work with like the short grass areas here on the eastern New Mexico and in Colorado and we compare 
similar treatments to prairies in mixed grass and short grass and tall grass and see how they all react. And by inducing drought in all of them, we see how they all react. And, and you know, the short grass prairies got it nailed. The short grass prairies got it figured out, and the tall grass prairie struggles under drought. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to see how different prairies respond to the same treatments. How did LTERs get started? Who initiates that? That's the National Science Foundation puts out a call for proposals, and they, they had just done that. Okay. And so they, they've got um, a new one, well, Sedietta, SEB here, had lost their funding, but they just got renewed, so they're back in. And um, Why is there nothing in the stock? <laughs> there's very few prayers. Oh, well. It's not just pretty though, is it? What what, the what did you, why are the, the LTERs why are there no none of them in the like the Gulf region, the South? You have to ask the National Science Foundation. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but they they had uh, see there's a new one on the East Coast and a new one right up here in Alaska. Oh. Yeah. You mentioned I, coral reef, is that yeah. the one? Oh. It's way up here. It's yeah. not even showing it. It's Morea, Coral Um Yeah, and it's interesting because I, they have to have an educator at each of these sites. But it's really tough to get somebody to come out to the Coral Reef <laughs> or to go to Antarctica, for example. And so it's really interesting to, for us to get together because we get together monthly and talk about what we're doing. And it's interesting to see what everybody's doing with their education projects. Most of them have things, have activities online. We are one of the few that bring kids to our site, and we are the only one to use docents. So we, we're, we're, we're massive compared special. to the other ones. Hmm? You're special. Well, we think so. It's a really smart idea. I yeah, think so too. It seems like all of them should do it. They would if they could. Well, Harvard Brook does. Um, but they need to have the facilities and they need to have schools nearby. Not many of them have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. City Ed is quite a long ways from anything that's a coral. Is it what? City Ed is. My son, my son did research there. He did he? Had, he had a sign out that said, I'm going back to this particular place. If I don't come back, please get me. Please come say that. Yeah. This is 15 yeah. miles back. In yeah. yeah, it's a hike. Yeah. It's cool. All right, let's take a break. Okay, so this is this is lesson number one. Everyone's going to know each other. This is lesson number one. When you're talking outside to a group, always let the wind be your friend. Don't fight the wind. So have your back to the wind and let the wind take your words to the group. Because This is Dave Kindle's quality over here. I'm trying my best. <laughs> okay, so the vast majority of school groups will come up here and stop here and unload the kids and they'll be unloaded because the door's on the right side and they'll be unloaded over there by the picnic tables. So that's just kind of an FYI. This is where the, the school bosses typically stop if they're not stopping at the nature trail. Um, so we'll go in the stone barn and we'll take a look. A couple of things. The stone barn was the first stone structure built on the Dewey Ranch. The Dewey Ranch was originally settled in the late 1800s by the Dewey family who had gotten their money from, <laughs> they were like the Trumps of their time, whatever you think <laughs> of them. But they, they got their money kind of exploitively from the Chicago fire. They bought up a whole bunch of land after it burned in the Chicago fire. So they kind of exploited that. Regardless, we 
we got, and they like to show off that they were wealthy, and so the, the barn was built first in 1911, and then the stone house was built in 1912 from the limestone that was quarried from this site. So the limestone actually came only about a quarter of a mile away from here. Uh, so let's go take a look. Now it's a, it's a meeting center, so come on in. <laughs> Okay, so you can see, you know, the, the conversion left a lot of the original elements of the barn. Uh, the, the barn held mainly draft horses, work horses. You know, they didn't have like thoroughbreds or something. They had the, the work horses, and the, this is actually owned by the Nature Conservancy, um, and they had a uh, a donor that helped pay for the conversion of it, and the, it's the Court of Family meetings. Many of you have been in here for a variety of meetings. It is not available. It is not available for weddings. <laughs> We're not going to come It's not available for weddings. We get calls almost every day. And then we have, you can come closer. We're just going to take a quick look. How are you? What is the last So this is the bison corral. We bring the bison in just once a year, and we work them. And by working, it means we bring them through a series of uh, stanchions and, and eventually to the blue structure. And the blue structure is a squeeze chute, and the squeeze chute is where they are. If you've ever worked cattle, you know, you squeeze them and it calms them down. Uh, they are weighed. We take Sometimes we will take a hair sample and sometimes we will take a blood sample. All of the new calves of the year get ear tags. So we have a really good and extensive set of data on bison weights and we see how their weights change from year to year. Um, we also cull the herd and by that I mean and cull C U L L. We are removing the any holes that are over seven years. That they, they keep, I mean, they, they will continue to grow for after like 10 or 15 years, and they just get big and unmanageable, and it's very difficult to work them when they get that big. And so, we remove bulls that are over seven years of age. It doesn't matter how pretty they are, it doesn't matter how majestic they stand, once they're over seven years of age, they're on the scene. We also remove cows, which is what a female. A female bison is a cow, which can be confusing to kids, so keep that in mind when you say, well, we, we took the cows out. They think you're talking about, you know, bovines. So make sure that they understand you're talking female cow or female bison. Female bison that get, are unproductive, they have not produced a calf within a couple of years, and plus they've gotten older and they're gone. Um, a lot of the two-year-old males are removed. So we usually Is, unfortunately, it's not open to the public because we have to keep the number of people that are out here to a minimum. But that's just now you notice that the, the, the shoots are curved, and that's based on the Temple Grandin design of not allowing animals get, to get caught in a corner, and so they can also see. 